Open your Bibles this evening to Zephaniah chapter 3 again. Zephaniah chapter 3. We're going to read verses 9 through 20 and pick back up in verse 11 where we left off. Last time we were astounded, um, challenged, uh, maybe even somewhat confused by the statement that the Lord was going to create a people of pure speech who call upon the name of the Lord. The prevailing wisdom among evangelical Christianity in the world is that, as, as they read this passage, they separate Israel and the church as two different peoples of God. This passage didn't, doesn't leave anything to the imagination when you interpret it through the lens of Christ. You understand that God speaks about his people as Jews and Gentiles. One group of people, one holy nation, one tribe of priests. And this uh, truth is championed over and over and over again in the New Testament. God has put away any distinction between Jew and Gentile. There is no one, nothing but Christ. He is the only dividing line between those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the, this world or the enemy. The Apostle Paul says it in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to see that picture of calling on the name of the Lord and the Lord dwelling with his people as we continue down through chapter 3 of Zephaniah. There's, you know, as we discussed last week, when the Lord speaks about those of pure lips, he's not talking about the Hebrew language, or speaking in tongues. Now, the scriptures are very clear about those who have pure lips are the ones that God has given a pure heart. And again, we're going to see God give two pictures of that this evening. God will speak of those who are prideful and haughty and exalt themselves. And he says, I will remove those. And God speaks of those who are lowly and humble. And God says, those are the ones that I will bring. Those are the ones that I will raise up. Those are my people. It is not a surprise then when we fast forward to Matthew chapter 5 and Jesus says, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who weep. The picture of God's people have always been the ones who never relied on themselves. They put their trust finally and only in God. And that line of people goes all the way back to Abel, to the very beginning. As the author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11, he begins at Abel and he recounts the deeds of Abraham and Jacob and uh, Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And he gets down through Moses and he goes, I could write all day and tell you of the the faith of the saints. And he mentions people like Samuel and Samson and Jephthah and all the way down. He says, this is the line of God's people. And we'll see more of that today as we'll read Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9 through 20. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst the proud exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain." But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly, and they shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. For those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouths a deceitful tongue. For they will graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. 
Rejoice and exult with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your bands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will extol over you with singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, and that, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all of your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all of the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all of the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy, infallible, and sufficient word. Dear Heavenly Father, as we have already prayed, we know your word is full of truth. It's full of treasure. Lord, give us a glimpse of that treasure this evening. And in that treasure, let none be higher than Christ. Let him be the centerpiece of all of our thoughts and desires, the very jewel of heaven himself. Lord, we pray to have a reality, a, an understanding, a experience, Lord, of the presence of your self with us. Your word promises that our Lord lives with his people. You promised while you were here incarnate on this earth that you would never leave us or forsake us, that you would send the comforter who would be with us moment by moment, guiding us into all truth. Lord, these are the promises in your word that we stand on, Lord, and we ask that you would keep us from error, that you would keep us from misunderstanding, you would keep us and guide us into all truth as you have promised. We rely on your goodness, Lord, in all of these things. We pray it because of your given desire to love Christ, to see Christ, to grow in Christ. In his name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we explored the text last time, I talked about the necessity of having Jesus as the hermeneutic, or another way to put it, the lens by which we understand the text. If we don't have that, we won't correctly under the, uh, understand the text. And as, like, as I mentioned last time, there are solid men of God, faithful teachers, brothers in Christ, who get this wrong. I have to say that in this day and age, it is almost the majority of brothers in Christ who get this wrong, thanks to a modern version of eschatology, of a modern understanding of, to put it simply, the book of Revelation, that separates the plan of God for salvation for the Gentiles and for the Jews. The scriptures do no such thing. We understand that we correctly understand the text. We know that we have correctly understood what we're reading when Christ, Jesus, is being exalted in the text completely. As we already looked at the first part of verse 11 last week, that's where we're going to pick up. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11 reads, On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For, when, for then I will remove from your midst your proud, exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. Meditated last time on about, about being put to shame. What does that mean? And how does that work? We, it is obvious that it only works through Christ. Because every natural born human carries a, with them a sinned nature where, by which we commit the most shameful of deeds. Every single one of us commits shameful deeds. So when the Lord says, on that day you shall not be put to shame, 
uh, because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, he speaks of two truths. The reality is he is speaking to re rebels who deserve shame. And he is saying, by my power, by what I will do, on that day when I act, the Lord says, you will not be put to shame. And this is a reality that we live in, the now and not yet. I know you've heard Pastor Gabe and probably myself speak of Martin Luther's saying, where Martin Luther would say, simultaneously, sinner and justified. That's the reality we live in right now. We live with this shameful, sinful nature that rebels on a daily basis against God. But at the very same time, God has said there is no condemnation. There is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, the end of the chapter, verse 31 through 39. The Apostle Paul asks the question quite simply. If Christ has paid all of the sins, who can condemn? How can, how can you bring a condemnation against God's people when Christ has already put away the shame? And this is the, 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 the uh, solution to every text of Scripture. Sinners deserve destruction. Sinners deserve the shame that they bear. Yet God promises that those that are His will not bear that shame. Christ is the equation, or as the Apostle Paul says, he, that Christ, in Christ, God is both just and the justifier. So there's a reality that we live in right now. From the moment that Christ said, teletestai, the Greek word that is translated, it is finished. It is finished. There is no more shame for us. There is no more condemnation. The, the enemy himself cannot bring a charge against the elect of God because Christ says, it's covered. It's done. I finished all the work to put that shame to rest. Their righteousness is my righteousness. And there is also the not yet. Be we see it now. As Martin Luther had said, we're sinners right now. And we're justified right now. We have no condemnation before the throne, and yet we still continue to commit shameful acts. There is a final day. There is a judgment day where God has appointed by one man, Jesus, to judge the whole world. We've already been given a glimpse of what that judgment looks like in the book of Revelation, where it says the books are opened. And everyone whose name was not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. God has a book, and he's written down the names of every single one of his people. And he has covered their sins in Christ, so that no matter the struggle they have with sin in this lifetime, they will be redeemed. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31, promises that day as coming. See, we as Christians live in the now and not yet. We live in the fact that Christ has come. The promises have been revealed. The debt has been paid. Yet there is still a consummation to come. And notice who, as, as the Lord continues here in verse 11, he says, For then I will remove from your midst your proud exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain." Notice there's an action on God's part here. God says, I will remove them from your midst. This is just like verse 9. He said, I will change the speech of the peoples. In, in Ezekiel chapter 36, he says, I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Everywhere throughout the scriptures, God takes credit for the salvation of his people which is why we, his people, rest assured, not in ourselves, but in him. You see the, the, the statement here. God says, I will remove the, 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 from your midst the proud, exultant ones. Someone who has come to rest in Christ alone for salvation does not carry with them any pride of their own power. By necessity. 
Those that are of God are not proudly exalted ones. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, there's no boasting. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he says, salvation and faith itself is a gift to where that no one can boast. No one can come along and say, well, I believed, and that's why God saved me. I did good, and that's why God saved me. No boasting is allowed because it is all what we call a monergistic work. God is the only actor in the, the equation. God is the only one saving. He's the one that purifies the hearts of his people. And in doing so, he purifies their speech, which we'll talk more about in a minute. He's the one who separates them from the world. Notice here, he's talking about, he says, I will remove from your midst the proud, exultant ones. The, the Lord in the New Testament refers to Christians as saints. The Greek word there is hagios, and it means holy ones. That's a, um, an often misunderstood term. Holiness is an is a attribute that is very far from the natural man. When, what is God saying when he says holy ones? So we, we can make it a picture of those that he set apart. That's a great way to describe it. The saints in the New Testament are pictured as a group of people that God reached down and he said, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to set them apart. I'm going to remove them from the world. Jesus tells us in John Chapter 17, as he prays, that he prays the Lord will keep them in the world. So in God's set-apartness, we don't leave the world. We don't disappear. It isn't like someone comes and says, I believe in Jesus. Poof, they're gone. No, we live in the middle of the world. But yet we are a set-apart people. And there's a character about that people that is righteously humble. Now, we live in the now and not yet. We'll talk about this also more in a minute, but there are many people who are Christians. When I say Christians, they call themselves Christian, who are haughty and arrogant people. I read an article today that stated that most servers, most waitresses and waiters at restaurants don't like working on Sundays because Christians are rude people. You think about it when a, a public newspaper, a public uh, or a internet news source writes an article calling Christians rude. That's a very different picture from what Zephaniah is saying. And that's because there are many who sit in the pews and churches of the United States who call themselves Christians who are not born again. They are not Christians. They carry all that evil and they find it comfortable in the church, which says a lot. The Lord says here, you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. There's much we could say about the holy mountain, the picture of the church the Apostle Paul in Galatians calls it the Jerusalem above. But there's a picture here developing. God says, I remove the haughty people from my church, from my people. The self-trusting ones, the self-exalting ones, the worldly ones. We look around at the world, at the church, and we see many self-exalting ones many worldly ones, many that are much, much more interested in their things of the world, whether it be their fishing boat or their golf course or their, their football game on TV. Whatever it is, that's their idol, that's their God. And we ask, Lord, it doesn't seem like you've removed the haughty ones. We live in the now and not yet. We live in the, in the time where God's people live right alongside even some that call themselves Christians who are not. You know the parable of the wheat and the tares. The end of the age when God sorts out the world and the angels are sent and the 
The wheat is gathered into the barn and the tares are burned with fire. What we know for certain is that everyone who is born again and believes on the name of the Lord will find haughtiness not within their character. They will find it contrary to the scriptures and they will be drawn to the image of Christ. So that the church, what we call the invisible church, the people of God all around the world will not have a single and do not at this moment have a single haughty, self-centered, self-righteous person. This is the work of God. We must separate between those who call themselves Christians and the reality that God saves all of his saints. Like I said, we could say much more about that holy mountain, but moving on to verse 12, the Lord describes the opposite here. He says, he says I'm going to take all of the haughty people, and they will not come near my holy place. And then in verse 12 he says, But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly, and they will seek refuge in the name of the Lord. As we already spoke about, there's no boasting in Christ. Those set-apart ones, those, those holy ones that have been made holy through the power of God are left nothing to be proudful and exultant about because salvation is from the Lord. God purifies their hearts. And it's how he does this is wonderful and amazing and challenging because in purifying the heart and opening the eyes and coming to rebirth, we are reminded of how wretched and depraved we once were. That realization of the wickedness that we once had and even the wickedness that we currently fight, how short we fall of God's glory every day brings us to complete dependence on Christ. We become a holy, humble, and lowly. Is it an immediate process? No. No. The Lord promises that we will go through sanctification. But one thing that all the people of God have is that they depend only on Christ. They do not raise their hand and say, I saved myself. They do not raise their hand and say, God saved me because he found some value in me. Don't be mistaken, brothers and sisters. There are prominent teachers in this world, false teachers, who say exactly that. God saved you because you believed. God saved you because, to use a bad analogy, you were the choice meat. The, the Christian, on the other hand, is completely dependent on Christ. There's a character about them that Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. And he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the characteristics of a humble people. Not a people who lifts themselves up and exalts themselves, but a people lowly that says, I have no righteousness of myself, and therefore I can love a sinner just like me. No matter if they've, they've offended me, no matter what wrong they've done to me, I understand that the debt I owe Christ is greater than I can ever pay, and that makes me his servant to show his love in this world. And yes, that love sometimes means calling out evil. Joy. Remember when James said, count it all joy, brothers, when you face all kinds of trials. Think about the picture there. When a, when a worldly person faces trouble, whoa, is me. I'll never get past this. I'll never survive this. A humble, lowly, Christ-dependent person says, your will be done, Lord. That I believe the promises of Scripture that all of these things will work together for my good. And what does that bring? Peace. It brings patience in the trial. It brings the, the kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. This is what 
James meant when he says, your endurance will increase. In case you missed it, saints, in case you missed it, it's time for self-examination. This is what we should always be doing. The Apostle Paul says, test yourself to see if you're of the faith. What are we testing? Do I exult in anything but Christ? Do I find love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control growing in my life? Is that, is that what I find when I examine myself? And then you examine yourself, you will find you fall very short of those things. And you will be forced to run to Christ. And every examination, every step, every effort in holiness conforms you more and more to the image of Christ. And that's what the end of verse 12 says. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. They are a humble a meek people that has no source of refuge in themselves, they say, the Lord God is the one who saves. The name Yahweh there. As we've talked about in the past, he is the one who says, he is the one that saves. He is the one that provides. These are the names and character of the Lord. And God's people find their faith in his refuge alone. We already quoted Paul in Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Believe me, the Apostle Paul was very familiar with the passage in Zephaniah. He was saying, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus is the people who shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. These are the people that Zephaniah was talking about. It, again, we just asked the question. Who are those that are saved? Who are those that find refuge in the name of the Lord? The New Testament calls them saints and Christians. And that's what we call them today. Christians. What does God name these people? In verse 13, it picks up in the middle of a sentence. It says, Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. That first passage right there. That first part of the, the sentence. Those who are in Israel. That's who Zephaniah is talking about. As we've already seen, it's Jews and Gentiles brought together in faith in the Lord, brought together in one place. And the Lord very clearly says, I'm going to change the speech of all of the peoples and even those of the dispersed ones, those are who have the, the Jewish lineage genetically will be part of this bringing in and they will bring in the offering. They will have pure lips. They will be faithful to me. And the Lord gets down here in verse 13 and says, those are Israel. There are some who call such a statement replacement theology. I, it, it is such a mischaracterization, I hardly know what to do with it. The reality is that the Israel of God, the one that Paul talks about in Galatians 6, have always been God's people. And they do no injustice and speak no lies, nor is there found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. Again, self-examination is necessary. Do you lie? Have you lied? Have you lied recently? Most saints will be able to say yes. A few of us have mastered that particular sin, but we're able to examine ourselves and find that there is injustice. There are lies. There is deceitfulness in some way or another, whether intentional or not. It's important to remember the now and not yet. We are righteous in Christ, and we are being made righteous. The New Testament uses the word saved in all three tenses. It speaks about 
saved in the past tense. It says, you have been saved. It says, saved in the present tense. You are being saved. And it also says saved in the future tense. You will be saved. Understand that the justification, sanctification, and glorification that God brings about his people means that in the midst of this process, sin it remains until they are perfected. We're not perfected yet, but we are indwelt. As we'll see next week, these people, in verse 13, this left in Israel are the ones in verse 14, that the king dwells with. We are being transformed into the image of the Son. Now let's ask the question the other way. Saint, if you found yourself lying, would you hate that? Would you call that a sin? Would you repent and turn away from it? That is the right question. See, these people hate injustice. They hate lies. They hate deceitfulness. They root it out of themselves everywhere they find it, and they fight with the sin nature that brings it back again. Paul calls this the battle of the flesh and the spirit. And the flesh and the spirit battle together until all is made perfect, until the new body with no more sin nature as we read this verse, we understand there is much, much evil in this world. There is so much deceitfulness, so much injustice, so much that, just for an example, to have a business arrangement, we do something called a contract. And there are pages after page after page after page after page that are written down in fine print just so we can cover all of the ways someone might cheat on that contract and say, no, you can't do that. The Apostle Paul says saints aren't to be like that. The Apostle Paul and Christ say, what you say, when you say yes, when you say no, let that be your word. The Apostle Paul says you don't take Christians to court you don't use a carnal, worldly judge to deal between the people of God because they believe in justice. If you have mistreated, as, we, as uh, Jesus said in cha Matthew chapter 5, if you have, your brother has ought against you as a Christian, if there's any dispute between you, that is number one on your priority list of being dealt with because you are a Christian. Notice, the only people that meet the description of what Zephaniah is talking about, are those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and receive the fruits of the Spirit. And what is the result? The end of verse 12 there says, For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Remember, brothers and sisters, we still live in the now and not yet. If you understand your salvation in Christ, you rejoice with the scriptures and with the Apostle Paul who says, O oh death, where is your sting? Where's, where's the fear? Yet, fear remains. The book I often recommend and read speaks about the Pilgrim's Progress. As Christian nears the end of his life, there's a river to cross into eternity. The picture of death. The death is often associated with deep waters in the scriptures. Christian's friend walks up to that river and walks right across it with no problems. Not even up to his knees. No fear, no difficulty, and then Christian approaches that river. And he has a hard time crossing. This is the reality. We wrestle with the fear of death, not because death is anything for a Christian to fear, but because we are in the now and not yet. 
One day we will look up beyond and back at death itself and realize that what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39 is true. We are more than conquerors. There's no fear of death. Or as the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being revealed from one glory to glory, from glory to glory. There is a glory that exists now because we are the people of God indwelt by the Holy Spirit with a different character and a different idea to where the very idea of injustice and lies and deceit is repulsive to us. That's a glory. It stands out in this world. But there's a glory to come. A glory of perfection. Where every battle is done. Every war is waged. And the perfect transformation of the saint is done. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, the people of God are Israel. And they have always been. From the very beginning. Just like today, there are many that call themselves Christians. They even go to church. But they're not Christians. Over the millennia, there have been many that called themselves Israel that never were. Israel, being in Israel, is not a case of genetics. It's a case of being in Christ. And that is why every single text of Scripture and every promise to Israel is, fi finds its application in Christ. This is the Apostle Paul's entire argument from Galatians chapter 3 to Galatians chapter 6. The promises to Abraham were for one person, one seed, and that is Christ. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are part of that promise because we are in him. And as we'll see next week, he dwells with us. We conclude with Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all of God's children will say, Amen.